Joseph Campbell was a philosopher who passed away in the late 1980s. He showed that all philosophies, religions, and stories that are passed down from generation or generation follow a lot of times a common theme. The theme is that there is a man or a woman who are in a world that is familiar to them, but then they cross a threshold into a world that's unknown to them. In that unknown world, there is an increasing amount of conflicts. Then they come face to face with their biggest enemy. When they're facing an enemy, they fall, they die, they come back to life. They come back with a new power, a new ability, an elixir. And with that elixir, they're able to defeat whatever it is that they're fighting. From there, they go back to the world they came from, but they have new knowledge that they're able to spread to new people. This is called a monomyth or the hero's journey. And every religion, every thought process, and everybody's life in one way or another mirrors this image. In his interview in 1988 for PBS called The Power of the Myth, Bill Moyers asked him, does everybody have to go on this journey alone? Joseph Campbell said no. If you know somebody who can go with you, then go with them. Today we're going to be interviewing a friend of mine who is on that journey with me. The reason we call this Life After is, yes, it's a play on the afterlife, but Also, it feels that a lot of us have died. We've started over with a new life. We were very religious and we weren't able to live our lives for ourselves, but we had to live a life that was given to us and facilitated and with a lot of boundaries. But now we're able to live more freely. In this life that I'm living now, there's other people walking with me that weren't walking with me before. One of those people is my friend Kristen. Today, we are going to talk to her about her experience of living an actual cult and what her life is like now. Kristen is one of the people that I know that is working very hard, that is rebuilding her life to be what she wants it to be. I'm Brady Harden, and this is The Life After. Chuck, life has gotten really weird. Um, we get emails on a daily basis from like actual fans. Right, right, right. Yeah. We have fans, Chuck. It's you not. And it's I. not even like fans. It's like people that are traumatized. I and know. Like need to, need to talk about it. And Sometimes I feel like we're kind of like the Harriet Tubmans of getting the heck out of Christianity. <laughs> is, That's not is that fair? fair is that a fair comparison? No, not, okay. no, not at all. Harriet Tubman. I she, apologize. She like risked her life. I think we're like just some jackasses on a podcast okay that's a very good point that nobody's heard of that's a very good point yeah. but you know what um we've, we're getting there though i've been seeing a common theme with a lot of the emails and, and messages that we're getting and that's that uh people want to talk about um kind of this loss of family and community that we had after we left and i right. think that's such a huge 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 thing about yeah. um deconstructing and leaving the faith it's insane because uh there really isn't uh well, there aren't there aren't many uh, areas in the in the secular world where the kind of community that you experience in churches exists. Right? Exactly, like where you see the same people all the time in a large setting, and you have a, a common interest or a, a commonality, and you have this. There's this sense of family, even though you know for a lot of people it's it's traumatic and toxic. It's still what family, family. is family, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. No. It's it's a it's community. It's it's a. It's what we crave, right? There was, it wasn't that long ago. I, I, I got obsessed with watching documentaries about cults and mm-hmm. um, weird religions and everything. But there was one thing that I noticed. Uh, there was a, uh, an amazing documentary on Netflix called Holy Hell. And it was yeah, about a, this. A, it. so, so, so good. It blew my mind. But in it, um, at the end of it, they kind of like showed where a lot of the uh, the members that were in it during the the documentary when I was taking place Mm -hmm. and showed where they are now. And a lot of them have joined other cults Oh, right. and it was almost as if they, they had such that need Mm -hmm. uh, to be part of that community. They got almost like addicted to it that they found it again um, to their detriment. Like, uh, like Edward Norton in uh, fight club. It just bounces around support groups. It's been so long since I've seen that, but I'm going to trust that you. Oh my God. Okay. uh, You should rewatch it. It's pretty good. Okay. I'll do that. It's, it's overrated though. Um, you know, 
<laughs> so many. Uh, this, is, this is a conversation points. I've had with people that have honestly people that have been out of church for years, mm-hmm. like a you know a decade or more. Um, express this this uh, this feeling like yeah I I miss youth group or you know I miss that's a big one right? yeah 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 like or just, mission trips right just things being, like that. having this common experience with other people and uh, right before I started this another a friend of mine who's local who's an atheist he approached me he's like hey what what is there for us right you know and I think that it's kind of a matter of us just getting a little bit more organized and more intentional about how we view people. I mean, I was telling you before the show today that um, even since we started this podcast that I feel like I have really started to make more deeper, more meaningful friendships with people. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I I think part of it is because I get to see you every week. Mm -hmm. Um, And also, you know, there's the friends that we have that are part of like the, the life after Facebook messaging that we have that of the people that I thought of when I first started of like, Hey, I want to make this podcast. it's, It's turned into a very intimate community. And so it's kind of cool that we we message each other every day, and I think we that yeah. anybody can do that. Anybody can mm-hmm. start. My improv, I, I've uh, just graduated my level one improv Sunday, and there was a group of us that got close, and we did the same thing. We just started like this Facebook message group right. that throughout the day. We're filling each other on each other's lives. and You know, it's really important to have, I think, what really drives that. You know, we have a lot of group chats in our lives, right? Everybody mm-hmm. has a group chat that they, you know, turn off notifications for because... Somebody's it's going like, to be overbearing. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like blasting ba-ding, with ba-ding, memes or something. Ba-ding. Right. Yeah. 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 But um, I think the reason that the, the, that our group chat, the life after group chat in particular functions is because we have this common goal. We have something that we're working on and towards together. Mm-hmm. Um, and that it doesn't matter what it is, but that's sort of what drives community, right? Like whether it's like kickball or, you know, deconstructing evangelicalism or, you know, Nietzschean philosophy or whatever like you get on there you find some people with with a common idea with something that you feel like you can communicate with them on you find a few more people and maybe get maybe get something going you know what I mean and it it, that's hard to do it's it's natural with church because we all have this idea of like Jesus God and we worship and we get together and we go on mission trips and we go on float trips or whatever Um, and it just sort of happens naturally in that environment so it's it's difficult when you leave church to find a way to to establish that commonality and and make something make a functioning community but that's what we need we have to do that right because there's this period of time after we leave church where we're sort of adrift we lose church friends we lose uh you know the 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 thing that brought us together with other people and we have to find something that's a huge point and that's that's tricky, you know. So but when it's I was important speaking of my improv class, that was one of the reasons I started taking it. Right, was yeah. I was uh, I even put on Facebook. I'm like, hey, how do people in their 30s even make friends? Like, I don't even know how to do that anymore, yeah. you know. And I've actually seen that like trope on sitcoms and everything as well. It's just it's a weird time in somebody's life to restart. Okay. So I, I started going to improv and there was one day, like it was the third or fourth week of our improv class where, um, our teacher was talking about how much vulnerable characters are more valuable than, than just like characters who have it all together. Right. So we didn't talk about vulnerability. So what she literally made us do was go around the room and say something that we're vulnerable about. Mm-hmm. Um, it mm-hmm. was insane. There were grown men crying and people not even able to get their words out cause they're blubbering so much. And just like, it was such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful moment. Yeah. But there were three or four of us that in our in our stories mentioned coming out of really conservative, mm. strong Christian backgrounds mm-hmm. and how much of a um, a detriment, how much of an obstacle that was yeah. for us. Um, and those are a lot of the ones that I ended up connecting with because we had so much of that in common. But um, it is such a common theme now. Um, yes, it is. It and, really is. And so I was so glad to have joined that improv like class, uh, even though it was just like eight or 10 weeks that now I'm able to have that sort of friendship with people I would not have met otherwise. What advice would you give to our listeners who are missing out on that sense of family and that are looking for a new type of community? Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I think, uh, I think finding that, I think the biggest thing for me is finding that, that, that commonality is finding something, finding a group of people that are passionate about something that you're also passionate about. 
Um, and it can be hard even, uh, you know, leaving religion, it can be hard to find something that you were passionate about Yeah, because you were passionate about religion. Like for, for you and me, Brady, that was our life. Like Absolutely. That was what we did. We mm-hmm. studied theology. We read books. We taught people. We, we had small groups. I had a house church. I was a leader. I was a worship leader. And that was what I poured all my energy into. And then when I, when I left, I had to, I had to, you know, think to myself like, well, what am I passionate about and what do I want and what do I want to do? And, um, and I, I, you know, realized that like music is, is my, my real passion, like my real, my actual, like that's what drives me, right? That's what inspires me. Um, and so I, I started working on music and I started inviting people in to work on music with me. Um, and I've established a lot of community that way. Um, so on, for me, on top of that, I mean, you know, I, I would think, uh, I would hope at some point that the, that this podcast could be a place for people to to sort of start to meet people. Hell yeah, yeah. I, I mean, mean, I think it's already happening, probably with the Facebook group and everything. I mean, like like I said before, like every day we're getting emails of seeing people saying, "Hey, I didn't realize other people were going through this," and that blows my mind. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we were we were all there, right? You felt the same way when you first yeah. left. Well, and that's why we started and this. It's is insane because now because we see we we see the. Like we we've like stepped up on a, a stage and now we can see the vast crowd, you know. <laughs> That's a great illustration. Yeah, that are like, oh, there are thousands of us. Yeah, you know, if not millions. Or, yeah, well, I think that a lot of like finding what you're passionate about has to do with what was lacking in my life. You know what I mean? Like it's kind of like uh, yeah. that sense of like um, become the adult that you needed as a kid. You know, right. and so I think with the podcast, it's more of like I really wish I would have had a resource like this when I was deconstructing, mm-hmm. and because I didn't have that, now I have the opportunity to mm-hmm. hopefully produce that in a way that's going to help other people, and that's that's what I'm that's what I want, that's what I'm passionate about. Yeah. But before, you know, in my Christian life, it was so much of um, I wrote a Christian novel. You know, I wanted to write all these things. I wrote sermons. I, you know, did all these things. Um, and when I left the faith, I couldn't write creatively for about three years. It took mm-hmm. me so long mm-hmm. to find my new voice. And now I'm working on a new project that, um, because before I feel like everything I had to f- ram Jesus Christ into it one way or another is yes. kind of like, it's yeah, like I felt the same way about music. I, I think of like a monkey on my back and mm-hmm. I don't mean that disrespectfully, um, or like Yoda, whenever, you know, Luke was training, it was just kind of like this burden mm-hmm. that like, <laughs> that no matter what I was doing, I had somehow had to fit him in and make sure that he felt included. I feel that with friends a lot of times. Hey, Jesus, then you must. <laughs> it's really, really good. <laughs> that was so good. But um, it, it's kind of like this idea if I have a new friend who doesn't I'm know. Also, I'm starting a small group of uh, Yoda impersonators. <laughs> <laughs> you can find them on Craigslist. Yeah, yeah. Small um, group I'm starting. Hmm. But it, it's kind of this idea that if I have a new friend um, and I'm introducing them to new friends, I, I get obsessed with making sure that they feel included and they feel yeah. comfortable. But that's how I felt about my religion is how I thought about Jesus yeah. is that no matter what I was doing, even though he wasn't there with me, I wanted to make sure that he felt that he was getting the attention yeah, everything. Yeah. He, yeah, and you know, now a, I don't have that. I don't have that burden. That's an anymore. interesting point that kind of plays into what you just said right before that about, uh, about what was missing right from your life before. Uh, because I think, uh, the word idolatry comes to mind, right? Because, because there was this big thing about like, well, don't make such and such an idol. It was like, what are you passionate about? Mm-hmm. Don't make it an idol. Yes. You know? and it was it, like, like for me, it was like music. Oh, don't make music an idol. Like it was a serious thing for musicians would talk about like, oh, I spend so many hours listening to albums a week, so many hours listening to music a week, but I don't, I spend X amount of hours praying and reading my Bible. And if it's, if the one outweighs the other, it's idolatry, right? Um, so maybe whatever you've, you've repressed because you felt like it was, it was going to be an idol is what you're actually passionate about and you you can find that you can be you can just do it now right because you've decided that you there are no idols and you know that's beautiful because as i'm listening i mentioned the very 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 beginning of this episode uh joseph campbell yes and so i'm listening to the power of the myth as a cbs special and he talks about following your bliss and i mean it's such like a trite thing and it's kind of like um it's kind of lost its meaning over the years but really finding the journey that you need to go on to is following what makes you happy. And it sounds so basic, but coming from a Christian background, we weren't 
always taught to do that. I mean, you yes. had the, per- the, the purpose driven life who kind of like hinted on it, right. but everything was still through oh, the Warren. filter of, well, make sure you do everything to make sure Jesus feels is included glorified. and God is glorified. Yeah. Right? Yes. But now like I find my when bliss I, now in when doing you, the like, opposite. Your favorite rapper says, follow your dreams. You can be like, yeah, yeah, I can. I'm I can. gonna do that. Well, I wrote a blog Kanye about that recently. <laughs> Which goes back to him. Um, I wrote a blog recently about Disney films, about how they talked about yes. us trusting yeah. ourselves yeah, and yeah. following our dreams and all these things, and how before we looked at that as like a negative, negative, negative. I like, remember uh, one of my teachers thing. in high school. I went to a Christian high school. Um, was talking about the intro to Arthur when he says, "Believe in yourself. That's a place to start." He's yeah, like, that's a that's a that's a toxic message because you need to believe in God, and now I'm like, no, no, like believe in yourself, <laughs> believe in yourself. But it, but it, it in, fits into in the indoctrination things. But believe in yourself. It fits into the indoctrination, doesn't it? Of like, yes. if you have a part of you that's saying, "Hey, this, some of this isn't right. I have doubts in this belief system," um, they want to encourage you not to listen to those doubts. Yes. Um, to follow blindly. And that's how you, that indoctrination is, is how you lose control of who you are and what is important to yourself. And eventually that, that voice um, gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Yes. Yes. Which goes right into our guest today. Um, oh, this sounds familiar. Yes. My, my dear friend, Kristen is going to join us um, after the break here in a little bit. And she's going to talk to us about, um, she literally joined a cult Yes, and it could have, been the rest of her life but thank goodness she got out of it yeah um she moved back here and, and she's also here listening to your story it could have been any of us right like it's not and that's the scary part well that's one of the things i want to talk to her about is what makes a cold a cold because honestly looking at how much power my community had over me um not sure that it wasn't a cult I'm not, where's the line i'm not i'm coming not sure. up on the life after this again We'll be right back after this. Do you have a story you want to tell us? Or a question you want answered? Do you need advice on how to handle family members who are upset at you because you're wrestling with your beliefs or leaving your religion? Have you experienced some weird religious shit that you need to tell people that might actually get it? Then contact us. Go to thelifeafter.org, all one word, and click the Contact Us page. Or Facebook us at facebook.com backslash thelifeafterorg. Or email us at info at thelifeafter.org we would love to hear hear. from let's do it together okay one two three we'd We'd love love to to hear hear from you you. or when you email us send us a voice recording we really like that too uh chuck i realize that a lot of times i introduce myself at the beginning of the podcast but i don't get to introduce you so why don't you introduce yourself i'm chuck parson what is this this is the life After. thank you i was really confused (laughs) awesome um we have a special guest today, my friend Kristen. Now, can we can we rehatch some some history that I have with with Kristen really fast? I mean, this is very important stuff. Yeah, no, I, I mean background background is very important. So she kind of joined my friend group for a hot minute. Um, it was like the you know the last season of Say by the Bell where they tried to add like another character, and you're just like, who the hell is this sort of thing? And then I didn't see her for twelve years. But before that, before that, I need to go back. Before that, we went on a date together. And oh. it was, uh, stop laughing! You're, you're not. Oh, I haven't introduced you yet. We can't hear your voice. Yeah, we're. Gonna, um, I'm gonna edit her out. Thank you. I wish I could edit her out of my memory of how oh, horrible please. this date was. You okay, Chris, what it. happened? Right. Just tell us what right. happened. Well, first of all, hey, hello, hi. thank you for hi, letting Krista. me on this podcast. This is my friend, Chris. Right? Hello. Hi. Um, our date was fantastic. A friend of our, not. a mutual friend of ours, set us up. 12 years ago, we were both in fundamentalist Christianity in the right. Heights. Brady the height. was like, he was a super smoldering, <laughs> he was, like, he was straighter than right? He was, yeah. He, he was, was more straighter. He was trying to be more straighter. Okay. I don't know. I mean, so we went on this date and my, you know, our friend set us up or whatever. We go out and he's like, hey, so I struggle with homosexuality. <laughs> 
Like first thing, first day in he would have said. Wait, he would have said. He would have said attraction to men, right? <laughs> yes. Or, or, uh, I, I struggle, struggle with same-sex same attraction. Same-sex attraction. That was exactly it. Yes. <laughs> I was like, okay. Oh, I love but you know this. what? At that time, it wasn't even like a deal breaker. I was just like, oh, this is a totally normal like, thing oh, for you cute. to disclose to me. Like, yeah. wow, on our first date, you're how really it? seeking after so God. So that wasn't oh even the, that wasn't even the deal breaker. That was like, no, oh, my personality was. I'm really <laughs> <laughs> You're like I'm really. He's really honest. <laughs> he's really straight. I, I think he no, really but loves how the Lord. Crazy yeah. was that, that that like I felt that I had to be so upfront with that because of of honesty. I felt yeah. I would have I would have been felt Absolutely. guilty if I didn't. Absolutely insane, insane. Yeah, yeah. It was full disclosure. Yeah, it but was, right up front, I could have right waited to like you yeah. know. And then we like you like tried to hold my hand in the parking. I lot. do remember that. It was like a Walmart yeah. parking yeah, lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, and, awesome. um, that's, that's was, about as Arnold as it gets. It was really awkward. <laughs> um, and then you. Why were you in a Walmart parking lot? I don't. I don't remember. We, we went don't... to like Starbucks or something. Yeah. Yes. And the then um, oh, you the know, one I was on like, Telegraph. I think There's I did like the whole right like, there. hey, let's just drive around and hang out for a bit, yeah, like exactly. that sort of thing. I mean, we're lucky it wasn't like a Buckeyes. A oh yes, lot. and Buckeyes very, for all of you who like don't know <laughs> is like uh, in the it's like a it's like a cattle <laughs> feed store that we have like you have to drive a, a bit tractor supply store yes yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. but uh, needless to say we didn't work out it, it didn't it did no, not work yeah, out I think yeah. the next day you you called me and said I did. Hey, yeah well you which called I me but yeah oh, wait I, this oh, isn't oh, your ex wife I need to go back over the the questionnaire they all look alike after a while. Um I had a type. What can I say? Right. I had they a type. all look alike after a while. <laughs> what does that mean? I'm gay now. Like, I know. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, what, are, what even yeah. are women? Whatever. It's like just all a women. homogenous group. <laughs> and then, uh, so we didn't work out. We didn't see each other for 12 years. Um, right. And our lives right. went in completely different directions. You deleted me from Facebook sometime I, Well, there. you know. Whatever. Yeah, and then it wasn't. I mean, until- no, that was before Facebook. I don't think I ever was your friend. It was a MySpace ever. time. It was yeah, it MySpace was MySpace. Era. We might have been. Yeah. And then, uh, out of nowhere, it was like a week before my birthday this yeah. year, back in February, yes. I get a friend request from you and a message. Oh my God. And uh, I I looked it up today before we got Did here. you? Oh yeah. my God. What did and I say? you start off by saying, hey, it's been like a decade, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I was like playing it very cool, and it, that's when we talked of like, yeah. of like, hey, what's going on in your life? And and then uh, we find out we both went through some really weird yeah. religious stuff, and then yeah. we're on the other side of that yes. now. And immediately, yeah. I invited you to my birthday party, of course. and yeah. literally just ignored all of my other friends and guests. It just caught <laughs> and up. And there with might you. have been a person in between. Yes, us my that friends we were like talking. Over. Did you try to hold her hand again, Brady? <laughs> Yeah, but in a platonic way. Okay. We're just like touching but the very beginning, and, like, I'm like, connecting. before we started messaging, I'm like, hey, I want you to know I'm actually gay now. I'm actually yeah, gay. Like, <laughs> so, you know, this can't happen. Like, yeah. Right. yeah. Just to set yeah. your... You're barking up the wrong tree. You're barking up the wrong tree. I see you pining after me. <laughs> right. Nice. I but, mean, we are both divorced, but still. But we have this cool happen. thing. We have this cool connection that our, uh, we've got kids around the same age. <laughs> yeah, my exactly. son and your two sons exactly. uh, who are adorable. And I absolutely love them. My son likes them. And for my son yeah. to like other people is amazing. Um, we let them play and we just like, we're like, hey, kids, go play. And then you and, and I will just. we're going to drink this pitcher of sangria. <laughs> it didn't catch up about our week and our dating lives. And it's it's a cool friendship because like I've yeah, never. It's fantastic. I love being this close to like, yeah. I don't know, to anybody, but also to like a, a straight woman. Because I feel like for the long time after yeah. I came out, it was all about me trying to build these friendships with gay people Absolutely. because I didn't have that. Mm-hmm. Breaking so like, into a new community. Yeah. Breaking into a new, new community. And now, um, with the exception of my, my friend Adina and a couple other people, yeah. and, and now it's like, it turns out, it's just so much more natural. Unlike what we learned in church, that you can just be friends with lots of people oh from God. lots of different walks of life. Yeah. yeah, and you don't have to have like, you don't want to have to be with them yeah. or like, or you don't want to, you don't have to share their beliefs. Yes. Yeah. They're not going to, they're not going to steer you down a dark path. It's just because they don't need to see the world the same way you do. That's a good point. So anyway, I'm really glad you're here and I cannot wait Me to hear too. your story. Absolutely. Let's jump right into it. Um, what happened after you 
and so obviously our date didn't work. So our date didn't work out, right? And then yeah. what happened? Because that's when your life went down. I mean, that should have been <laughs> that's a... That's when it went down. That should have been I mean, it was like, a okay, sign, but let's right? talk about this because it you was already... You could have already, had Brady wreck your life. I could have. <laughs> that would have been... But you know what? I would have been at the top of the food chain because Brady was pastor material. And the highest was, a woman was. can go in the church is a pastor's wife. So... Yes. That would have been the height of my... The height of my... Christian career. fundamentalism career. Yeah, yeah exactly. My you could have been a pastor's career. wife. Oh my God. That There's was like my a aspiration, movie. right? I wanted to be a pastor, but I couldn't be a pastor. So I would have to settle for being a pastor's wife. Right. Well, I, honestly though, like all sincerity, was that kind of your mindset? Do you think? You were very attracted to me because of your outspokenness, your passion for God and like your role in the church. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And I mean, I literally would think to myself, like, yeah, I want to be a pastor, right? Because you want to grow as a Christian. But that's your only option as a woman is to be someone's wife because it's always about who you're related to, right? It's not about you as a person. Mm -hmm. So that's the highest you can go. So, I mean, I know you and I know your story. So I know that that's kind of like a common theme that we'll we'll get to soon. A little bit of Mm -hmm. foreshadowing. All right, all right, all right. So uh, tell tell our listeners what happens. where things kind of went from like, oh, hey, I just go to a church and this is normal, right? right? To, hey, I am stuck in this cultish community. What am I going to do? Right. Okay. So, I mean, I think that's something that you only see in retrospect. Obviously, nobody is like, I'm joining a cult. I mean, I don't think anyway. Because you're a very Um, intelligent person. It's not like you would have been easy to fool. I mean, I would consider myself extremely intelligent. And yeah. Well, well. I mean, well. I mean. Take it back. I've got like high (laughs) self-confidence. So, so, yeah. So, I grew up in fundamentalist Christianity in a family uh, that really valued like living your values right and so it was like if you want to be an authentic christian you have to really think about how that is in every aspect of your life um which i think set me up for this situation in a lot of ways so when i was 18 or 19 years old uh my youth pastor moved across the country and he was like this very charismatic leader, like not charismatic in the spiritual sense at that time. Oh, right. Okay. But uh, just like you people know, wanted to follow him. Yes. yes, exactly. He was very intense, had these like deep teachings and it was like for, uh, you know, teenagers. He didn't treat us like children. We like dug into theology and everybody really absorbed it and loved it. And so um, he moved or whatever. And we kept in contact and I was really like, I want to grow spiritually, whatever. I wasn't feeling it in the place that I was living in my hometown. And I'd never felt at home here. And so I was like, yeah, of course I'm going to move. And so a couple of my friends moved out across the country, which probably, probably should have been a red flag initially right mm-hmm. uh looking back but i think we could re- like a, we like could a... rename this podcast that probably should have been a red flag <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right <laughs> where are you gonna say Wait, Jack? where would we put the asterisk um, <laughs> I, yeah, I was just gonna say yes like yeah uh that that seems to be a thing where extreme devotion i mean yeah. like yeah like sacrificing your current life yes, right like right. make yeah well, and especially as a teenager, 18 or 19, obviously. And there like, are good reasons to do yeah. that, obviously. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's, uh, anyway. Well, and in our culture, that would be one, that would be the top and only reason, right? To follow right. God and to follow your, your spiritual bliss, right? Yes. Which is God, the Holy Spirit, whatever. Um, so he went out there and a friend of mine, she was one of my closest friends and she just called me and was like, are you moving out here? And I was like, Okay. Like, what did your family just like oh yeah okay yes i am i wasn't feeling satisfied with where i was at here and so i was like i'm i'm gonna go and i'm gonna like continue my spiritual journey and like try to grow deeper or whatever i I can leave this all behind and that felt so heightened and spiritual what did your family think about you moving um so my parents were not thrilled and they were like you know my dad he was just like you know i really i want you to pray about this and i want you to wait one year i don't want you to make a rash decision and i wasn't happy about it but i did i waited an entire you did year. wait a year i wow. did i waited an entire year and i considered it and i mean i mean as much as a 18 year old can consider something um and then i i ended up moving out i took a and greyhound across the country and i moved that's and, ballsy that's very yeah. brave yeah and so I got out there and uh, it started out as just like, you know, hanging out, living, living here and being at this church or whatever that my old youth pastor is now pastoring and living with my friends who were out there. And then over time, like within a couple of months, he had this idea of like, I'm going to, I'm going to make a discipleship school. So the way the church was structured, it was like an old movie theater with 
four apartments above it. And so we lived in the apartments already. And he was just like, uh, you know, you guys all moved here. You're super spiritual or whatever. I want you to be a part of this. And so uh, we we became a part of it. We were basically grandfathered in. I mean, if you can it be It seemed like a natural progression. Exactly. Right? Like, oh, exactly, this is right. the next step. This is easy. Like, yeah, exactly. I moved out here to be spiritual, to, to seek God so deeply. And so, of course, like this is the person I want to learn from because I've admired him for a long time. I've like... And he had the approval of like everyone in my life, right? And so yeah. my family and and my, my entire church family that I grew up with, people that I thought I could trust. And so I was like, okay. Well, the prerequisite for a lot of these people yeah. of like who to trust, it has to do with how good is their theology? Exactly. How good are oh, they exactly right. yeah. regurgitating? How, how well do they perform on stage? Absolutely. I mean, like people yeah. don't realize the the level that I think rhetoric plays mm-hmm. in, in uh, religious communities like if you're a good rhetorician literally yeah. like if you are good at speaking and presenting ideas mm-hmm. you are perceived as a as a trustworthy good leader Absolutely. right which is not necessarily the case sometimes it is well, ironically just really quick like at the same time i was going to a church that was an old movie theater yeah. and our pastor um, was very 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 charismatic and it was like a movement it felt like mm-hmm. when i was there but to find out like he was swindling money. Yeah. He was stealing it from people in the church. Mm-hmm. He had like warrant out for his arrest. Mm-hmm. Um, he stole a lot of money from um, some radio station and yeah. had to like hightail it out to like L- or Las Vegas or something. Yeah. But it was kind of like that same idea of like, well, he was very, very charismatic. In fact, I found out he would practice um, speaking by listening to cassette tapes in his car and like redoing those sermons and oh. that would become his sermons. Interesting. Um, and weird thing that Hulu has this show about a cult um, called The Way. I think it's called The okay. Way. And on there, the cult leader does the same thing where he listens to cassette tapes. And Ooh. I'm just like, Ugh, it's weird so disgusting. Throwback, I know, right? Yeah. It's too close oh to God. home. Too close to home. Mm. But tell us more about your experience. Like, how many of your friends that you knew from back here yeah. went out there? So, after the School of Discipleship, which is like we referred to as SOD, right? Um, so creepy. SOD is very creepy. It has its own acronym. Um, and so we were like, Probably eight or nine of my friends end up moving, all teenagers from from my hometown mm-hmm. to uh, like across the country, leaving behind college. And how many and, people lived in this building or how many people were a part of this community? So it ended up being about 12 or 14 people. It fluctuated okay. a little bit because it was like eight or nine of us and then a few people that were local. Mm-hmm. How close were you to them? Okay, so we lived together. We had like several meetings a week. We served at the church together. Some of us worked together. We were very close. And there was it was encouraged to be this like to be really authentic. You had to be fully open and honest. So that meant like disclosing everything that you could think of mm-hmm. that was a deep dark secret. Uh, and so it was I would have like, been great at that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> right? And so it was like basically confession all the time. Okay. Wow. Yeah, it was intense. Like what kind of things would you, I mean, don't get into specifics. (laughs) I'm like, my goal is to recreate this community right here around this table. Tell us, Kristen, what you confess. Yeah, but like, what deal? kind of themes? The life what, like, is purchasing a building in downtown St. Louis. <laughs> yeah. If you're interested, come move in with us. No, but like, what kind of themes would be confessed? Like, just like everyday things. Like, I mean, it would that- be anything from everyday things to like people's pornography addiction, people like having sex, or you know. Here's my question: What were thoughts a big thing? Thoughts. Okay, yes, that was the biggest thing. Right. right. Just thinking something. Right, um, yeah, which is crazy, yes, and I think it's so, it's so normal when you're yeah. in that that evangelical fundamentalist like sort of setting, yeah, to to confess thoughts or to think that thoughts are are bad, evil, yes, right, mm-hmm. absolutely, and they're ju- they're thoughts, yeah. Right. Right. Well, you and when I was, I mean, therapy, like, if you think yeah. they're leading you towards doing something yeah. harmful to somebody, then yes, talk about your thoughts. Yeah. But like, your thoughts are your thoughts, kind of. But it's like what happens with the community space. whenever you accept an indoctrination is that you take that that mindset of mm-hmm. like, here are the rules, here are the regulations, here are the boundaries, and then when you indoctrinate yourself, you literally create those boundaries and you put them in your own mind yeah so you no absolutely. longer need that community to do absolutely. that for you you're doing it to yourself yeah, it's self-imposed absolutely yeah. and then it sounds like this was kind of a way to externalize that of saying well yeah. here's here's where i'm failing here's how i'm not fitting yeah. into this perfect like cookie cutter like mm-hmm. boundary thing yeah. and i i feel that it's sinful so now i need to confess it to it well and it's and that's that's an easy way to establish control yeah. Because you have, yeah. you now have somebody's thoughts. You don't have to do the work because exactly. they're doing the work for yes. you exactly. inside of their own heads. Yes. Well, and that's the thing too, is that you think about it and 
And the way that I grew up absolutely set me up to accept that and be like, oh, that's reasonable. That's fine. But I, I mean, like when it comes down to it, yeah, that's crazy. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. It just ended up being. So let me ask you this. Do you feel that? Um, so you made a transition from what we might call normal church right. into a cult, right. Right? right? Do you feel that your experience in normal church yeah. set you up to, to join? Oh, that's a, cult? a good question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I do, because I think what you learn in normal church is, uh, okay, your thoughts are evil, <laughs> right? Always just, you are evil. Like anything you do is probably sinful. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and basically not to trust your instincts. And so I think hmm. that sets you up basically Damn. to never to never listen to your own voice. So when you hear something, you should probably assume that you're not smart enough to know that thing. And yes. so then that sets you up to need someone else's affirmation. Yes. Who do wow. you yeah. trust if you don't trust yourself? Absolutely. And so in that case, it's, you know, your pastor, your spiritual leader. And then in, in my specific case, it's like also your community and uh and spiritual parent, which was something that was assigned to us at okay. that time. So. In the cult or before? In the cult, okay. not before. Yeah, but yeah. I think, you know, mentorship is definitely an idea that sure. is yeah. widely accepted. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so tell like me a- more about this cult. So, so, far, so far we know that you're all living together. It's kind of like a communal living thing. Yeah. Communal living is not a cult. Um, communal right. living can be a, a positive thing. What What is it a kind of, what power and control kind of made this into a situation where it was not helpful? Yeah. So I think what crossed that line was, uh, you know, we started off like everybody's super cool. And this pastor has like built everyone up like, oh, you're so deeply spiritual. Be a part of this group because you're so deeply spiritual. So Mm -hmm. um, I think that was like the first foothold in gaining control over people is like making them feel special. And then uh, beyond that, we like had to go through this teaching of, uh, spiritual giftings, right? And it's not your normal, like, I've got the the gift of service or teaching or whatever. Right. Do you remember those questionnaires? Yeah. It was one of those. Like, f- it would like take 15 minutes and turn it into your yeah. youth pastor and be like, you have the gift of worship. Yeah. Or you have the gift it's of like prophecy. a fundamentalist, like, like, I don't know what yeah. prophecy yeah. means. Can I see the future? <laughs> yeah. No, that, that was weird. Was prophecy on there even? Oh, prophecy. Yeah, yeah. It was. The ones that I did oh was. We, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I, like I was prophecy. Because it's all based on that passage in Corinthians. Oh, right. Corinthians. But it's kind of like the Meyer Briggs for fundamentalists yeah kind of yeah kind yeah it's it like a personality yeah. test yeah. yeah yeah well this was like a level deeper so okay. this had what like happened? seven seven different giftings or whatever but it was like your light and your dark so it like you know most of those are just like this is where you would fit in the church but this was like these are the ways in which you're light and these are the ways in which you're dark like it was very uh that's really different that's yeah Exactly. So that made a big difference. And then once we found out what our giftings were, uh, then we were assigned spiritual parents. It wasn't like, oh, who do you have a natural relationship with in this church? Wait, what is a spiritual parent? So um, in the model that we were living under, it was basically like uh, someone that's older than you that can guide you spiritually. But also in this context, it was like, um, you're a spiritual baby. Everyone, you know, they kind of told us like these this is your spiritual ages you guys are toddlers or whatever right which was interesting and made everyone kind of act a little less mature i think um but the spiritual parent then was considered the umbrella so basically they were like you have to listen to the spiritual parent whatever they say they're hearing from god for you um but like, what kind of things are we so talking about? We're talking about like, you know, I was told to quit my job or take another job or um, basically pray about this, pray about that. Date, don't date, uh, you know, where you're spending your time, where you're spending your money, all of those things. How many people were spiritual parents? How many people could play that role in this community? Oh, like per person? No, like, like, uh, like how many, like there were like, like... There was a different one for every single person, if that's oh, what you're okay, asking. Okay. So everyone so had an individual. So it was a lot. It was like generally uh, elders in the church. Mine, however, was the church secretary. Okay. And she was only four years older than me. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I was like 19 when I moved there. So <laughs> she was very <laughs> she was emotionally super experienced. Mature. But what kind of things did she tell you to do or not to do? Yeah. Like specifically so for your situation. Specifically for my situation, there was a time in which she was like, you need to go back and visit your family for the holidays for three weeks. Um, and that, well, the way she framed it was like, uh, do this, like pray about doing this. But 
you know, so whatever you do is fine, but pray about it. Right. And so when that happens, you're just like, well, I'm this, right. That's like what you really want. What would happen if you went against what she said? Um, you're basically judged as spiritual or not spiritual or, you know, like shamed what's, back yeah, into shamed, submission. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So it's like not just what's being said overtly, but what the implicit message is with that. And since you're in, I mean, you're, you're interacting with these people daily, right? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're probably not, I'm assuming you're not interacting with a whole lot of people outside of this community. I mean, I actually interacted with a lot. I was a barista at the time. Oh, okay. So cool. I had a lot yeah, of community yeah. connections. However, I didn't pursue a lot of those more deeply because this was my main devotion, right? right? If I was going to pursue those relationships, it would only be in the context of like, come see what we're doing. We're so right. different. Come to our art night. Cause we're really cool. And like, yeah, forward yeah. thinking. Right, right. So there was there was like outreach stuff. Absolutely. So you're so there are there are cultural consequences for not listening to your spiritual. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and so if you didn't listen to your spiritual parent, it basically is like uh, you go before the whole community. You're supposed to, in this culture, bring every decision basically before your spiritual parent, before the community, and ultimately before the pastor right and so so Kristen, what i'm hearing is that uh it sounds like a, a lot of the stuff that you're describing is is normal church stuff sure, right like sure. like discipleship leadership mm -hmm. you know you're you're submitting to your leaders Absolutely. you're listening to but this is this is way more extreme yeah in your i case. mean it's intensive it's every day it's, it's every day in it's, your space all it's the a time. concentric community yeah. it's it's a closed space absolutely um and there's it's there's a lot more control there's a, mm -hmm. a lot more attempt to control um but but sort of what my takeaway from this is that this is not that different from from church culture right. but it's just a step further like taking to the extreme and exactly. well, the fact that you all lived together yeah. like you did not have an opportunity to be at home by yourself mm -hmm. it was you were being controlled and being told who to date who not to date what jobs to take all these different things yeah. it sort of begs the question where's the line between mm -hmm. church and cult and, and what dictates that right i think we're gonna try to brady wants to get into that when we get back so we're gonna take a quick break and uh we're gonna talk about that line what makes a cult a cult cult we'll be back <laughs> <laughs> extra extra read all about it why are you trying to sell a newspaper on our podcast i'm not i'm telling our listeners about the blog did you know that podcast is only one of the themes that we produce yes we also have a blog on the lifeafter.org posts about starting over after religious trauma but don't you think you're being a little extra I am extra, and you can read all about it on the lifeafter.org. But um, bum. Welcome back. Um, so I, I wanted to talk about what makes a cult a cult. Like, what what made your community different than the church that I went to, or that you went to, or anything like that? Um, you were living. Your living arrangement was dependent on this situation. Absolutely. On this, what would have happened if you would have disobeyed orders? Where would you have ended up? Well, uh, actually, my, my very best friend, her and I were constantly in trouble. <laughs> and she got in a lot more trouble than I did one time for, I, I don't know, we were studying submission. And both of us were just like constantly getting reamed for this. And for her, even though both of us were trying, you know, being obedient and whatever all the time, um, for some reason, it just wasn't satisfactory. It was like, oh, head heart thing. Like your head's in it, but your heart isn't, right? Which is like, what the mm. fuck do you do with that? Yeah, right. And so uh, for her, they they basically, um, they called on church, church discipline at that time, right? And so she had to go before the elders and whatever, and whatever case was presented. And this was all done secretly. None of us knew about it. We just knew she had this meeting and she just came back uh, completely laid out just crying for days and days. And what ended up happening was that she got kicked out basically back to our hometown because she was from our hometown. And, you know, so she had to move back across the country based on church discipline. Uh, wow. So that's, that's what the fuck happens mm. when you, yeah. when you fall out of line enough. Wow. I guess. Yeah. Okay. So, so there was a, there was a threat. There was a real threat. Yeah, absolutely. You lose everything at like everything, right? Because right. your entire life is built around this community, you know, a very tight knit community. Yeah. And, and yeah, so. But if you, 
if you want to leave, you lose everything too. Absolutely. Because the way that the way that a Christian, you know, when I was in in my Bible college, et cetera, we we define cult as a um, a small group of of whatever that, that had a belief system that was not incongruent with the orthodoxy of Christianity. Okay. Right. But I don't yeah, view yeah. it that that's way anymore because that's a different, yeah, I yeah. don't think that matters. I think that no. you right. can, can, you can have a if complete anything. cult, a, a, a very controlling controlled mm-hmm. environment, um, with just, Oh yeah, well, we just believe the gospel. We mm-hmm. just believe the Bible. Right. I think that Christians, um, be, before I, I would, I'm not going to speak for anybody else. Yeah. I would have had this output of like, well, no, if they have all their theology, right. There's no way that exactly. they could have been it's treating about the people. Yeah. They could have been treating people, but no, it's not about theology. It's more about mm-hmm. control and Absolutely. your ability to be an autonomous human being. Mm-hmm. Um, but you had all of that control that, that, stripped from you well and the way it's framed too is not that you're not autonomous it's just that you like need to be in line with the holy spirit right and if you're in the holy spirit these are the these are the choices that you will be making right? and he was telling and so you, you what the holy spirit wanted exactly with these people right with the spiritual parents and like yeah the elders the pastor whoever else so yeah the choice wasn't actually autonomous but it was framed as being autonomous which is why it, i think it makes it even more insidious what was spiritually speaking Mm-hmm. What was on the line? If you would have been disfellowshipped or been kicked out of this place, mm-hmm. um, was there an idea that they were telling you that you weren't a Christian or that you, how did that work for them? Um, no, it wasn't that. And it was all framed like in love, you know, this way. So you can find God again, basically uh, just that you're uh, like sinful, you know, that's all that you're like deeply sinful. You're too far gone. And this is to to bring you back into the fold is to send you away. Wow. And what happens if you would have kept on going? What was their 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 theology or viewpoint on that? What what would they have thought about your soul? Yeah, yeah so um, going. I'm not sure what their viewpoint exactly would have been. I don't think it was like you'll lose your salvation because we weren't Nazarene brethren. But I, there was varying viewpoints between Calvinism versus Arminianism, like free will versus you're destined to be Christian regardless. It's interesting because my, my community was very Calvinistic, but there was this idea that um, if you were disfellowshipped, it was a signal that you were never saved. That you were never saved, place. exactly. And that's yeah. how they would have worded and yeah, framed it. Absolutely. But like, uh, we could throw that around, like, oh, salvation, salvation, salvation. Mm-hmm. But when you're, for me, I was indoctrinated as a, as a toddler yeah, growing up absolutely. in the church. And the idea is if I'm not saved, then I'm going to burn in hell mm-hmm. for eternity. Mm-hmm. And I think that we've kind of like lost over the importance of telling a toddler that. Mm-hmm. And then what that means then when that toddler becomes a 20 something year old, yeah. um, mm-hmm. we're talking mm-hmm. about eternal damnation. Yeah. There's and a lot on the line. Th- there's everything yeah. that we can ever even imagine. So it, it it's just like the tell all like, Hey, I want to control over you. So I'm going to loom this over your head. There's right. a possibility. Well, what's that so poignant be- about that too, is that, you know, you don't, you don't get the choice to be happy in this life in Christianity, right? That's not one of the values of Christianity. In fact, it's discouraged, right? You want joy, not happiness because joy is deep. Um, but you find joy in suffering in the Bible. And so basically you put all your stock in happiness happening in the afterlife in right. yeah, like after you die. So like if you suddenly don't believe like, well, fuck, you know, like now, now you have no chance at happiness ever. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you started to see that this, there's a, this bal- there's an unbalance of yeah. how this community is working and what you feel comfortable with. How did you get out? Well, actually, I didn't see that, right? Um, you know, it got it got gradually more charismatic. Everything became about the prophetic and whatever. And then we, I, I basically got out because I was introduced to uh, a man that I eventually ended up marrying. And then that, that ended up being like a huge clusterfuck as well. But it was the only way that I was going to get out was because the way that women are valued in the church, the only way that I was going to get out was like by fulfilling my role as a wife. It was the only thing I wanted more, right? Because it would bring me closer to God or whatever. And so I was fortunate that uh, that my husband at the time like saw that I was dating him and like the friends of ours that introduced us saw that and they convinced me that like, yeah, this is controlling on a level that's not normal and you need to come out. So we got married. So he saw that. He saw that. Yeah. Wow. And he was the only reason I was willing to even consider what he was saying was because 
he had somehow like the respect of my pastor. Right. And so he had this credibility with me that I was like willing to listen to him, Mm -hmm. which otherwise I wouldn't Mm -hmm. have been, you Mm -hmm. know, if he hadn't been widely accepted. So the system kind of backfired. Yeah. Yeah. Backfired a little bit. Yeah. So he was like a fairly known Christian man in the community. Not exactly, okay. but um, when he came, I think he was charismatic himself enough that my pastor had to like allow his viewpoint to be heard. He had this like real conversion experience where he like heard God's voice. Mm-hmm. It would like gave him, and because we were becoming more mystical in okay. like uh, our beliefs and orientation, mm-hmm. like as a church and and like personally, they were willing to be like, "Wow, that like really lends a lot of backing to him, a lot mm-hmm. of authority. It gives him a lot of authority." But your ex-husband knew, like, there's way too much power here that they're controlling yeah, you. absolutely. And so I went basically from one to the other, right? And so uh, I got married, and and that was what it was. But basically, we got married and never went back. Literally, just never went back. Where did you end up going? I mean, just, okay, so we started, we started kind of researching, like, on our own, then what is the church, right? And so what we came to together was like, oh, it's not it's not the church that's bad, it's the hierarchy. That's what causes the control, right? When there's a one up, one down system, lay people over over like the pastors. The clergy over there. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. clergy. Yeah. And so we kind of sought more um like similar to Chuck's story of like an organic thing where everybody's equal and uh that was gonna fix everything. Out of curiosity, were you reading Barna? George Barnett, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Pagan Christianity. Absolutely. Pagan Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. We were oh, like wow. really into that. Right, absolutely. right. Yeah, for sure. That's not, I mean, I can you can tell just by the language that you're yeah. using. Yeah, oh absolutely. So that's similar. Yeah, that that really that book inspired me to to, to start that house church. For yeah. Sure. Uh I forget the Uh Viola. Frank Viola. Yes. Oh, okay. That was the book that we started on. Oh, oh my god. It was a Frank Viola guys. book and that led us to yeah. George Barna and like right. yeah. So yeah, that yeah. whole thing. So totally that was natural like, progression. Yeah, I, and, 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 like, and to a degree, I, I would say I still have respect for those leaders, yeah. regardless of how my story ended up. You know, like yeah, they're they're absolutely. they're pretty, they're not crazy people, right? Yeah. I don't think. Well, and I mean, I think that idea it does it. I I think it's credible in some ways, right? Yeah. Like when you uh, create a system of equality, like that's yeah. better always. It is yeah. correct. Yes. Yeah. So, wh- how did your new spiritual community look compared to your old one? Okay, so we wanted that to happen (laughs) and we looked for it to happen, but we just didn't have enough people. We didn't have enough resources outside. Like my entire life in that state across the world, like or across the country, it it was only around the church. So when we left and I left all my friends, I we had no other resources. He grew up in that area, but had moved away and come back and was also in the church when he was away and hadn't contacted anyone that that lived there in like over 10 years. So we didn't have even really a friend base to make that happen. And it's like a very conservative part of the country. And so everyone there was like very into the church thing. Right. And so if you weren't in a church, you weren't going to meet people that were interested in that. Um, so we pined for that and, and tried to achieve it and we just never did. So it was just lonely. How did your previous friends from your, from your cult, like how did they respond to you leaving? You know, it, what's really interesting is that uh, being in that cult, there was a call at one time to make a covenant commitment. And so they were like, these are lifetime bonds, especially within this community, within the school of discipleship. This wow. is basically a marriage commitment, a mm-hmm. lifetime, lifelong, forever friendship. And uh, and so... Until they kicked you out because you yeah, did something you didn't like. Until they kicked me out. Well, I like left, but still, yeah. yeah. And so once that happened, it was so fascinating because... No one contacted me. I left and like no one came after me at all. And you moved across the country for this place. I moved across the country. You for this were place. spending your entire life and every some of these day with were people them. that I like grew up with yeah. my entire life, you know? Yeah. And you're sharing your deepest, darkest, sinful secrets and, and all this mm, stuff. And then suddenly mm. it just doesn't matter at all. Yeah. So we, we, I mean, I lost everything That's personally. Painful. Absolutely. Yeah. And it was lonely for three, four years. It was agonizing. Yeah. I mean, they didn't make you drink a Kool-Aid. There was no Kool-Aid. There was no like drug use or anything like that. But (laughs) this sort of like, (laughs) like, but this sort of like disfellowship, this sort of like cutting out is, is 
is its own kind of so abusive, yeah, very abusive yeah. so abusive and so controlling well it's such high stakes socially personally mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. it's everything where did things go wrong with your next community to then i mean were you did you have kids at this point or so, when i mean my non-community your non-community <laughs> you, right. my marriage is that that's what i meant yeah <laughs> Uh, so where things <laughs> went wrong, we had a, an unhappy marriage and I can say that now I could never have admitted we it didn't know. during like, that yeah, time. Right, yeah. Right. And also like you feel it and you can't say it, right? You're not allowed to say it. Um, you're allowed to pray harder. You're allowed to work harder. And that's what I did. And, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. and I, and so like, I feel like I was always a problem. Um, and I could never... I could never figure out what it was. I was just always feeling around it, trying to fix it. And uh, so things came to a head. We had a child, uh, got pregnant my first year of marriage and and had our first son. Oh, that's so soon. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yes, because especially especially because we had only known each other one year. Okay. Yeah, yeah. At the point of getting married, which is typical of Christianity Um, and like totally endorsed, totally normal because God speaks to you and tells you who your spouse is going to be. Sure, sure. Of course. So, um, oh, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And so, you know, I felt this problem. And uh, so we had a child. We had another child. You know, we we just rolled with it, even though I was feeling very stressed out. And so for our fifth year wedding anniversary, yeah, time just rolls by. We're unhappy. I'm working hard. Um, and and on our fifth wedding anniversary, we decided we're going to go on a trip. And we come back from this trip. We're driving back. And I just, like, get this sense. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, I, I don't know why, but I just feel like I need to ask my spouse at the time, like, have you ever been unfaithful to me? Mm-hmm. I don't know why I get this feeling. It's weird. And so... Um, it was I, from the Lord. It was from... I know, right? Isn't that like, uh, I don't love that. <laughs> right. But it kind of is like that. Yeah, too. yeah. I think it was your... I would say now that it was your subconscious. Your intuition. Picking up on things. Crying out. Yeah. Picking up on things that, that you weren't... Your consciousness yeah, wasn't. Yeah. I, I mean, I absolutely wasn't. I had no real reason to think this. And so um, I ask and he's like, no, no, whatever. And, um, you know, we go along and he's like suddenly is like crying what and so he's shaking and crying i'm so terrible i'm so terrible i'm like okay like spill it what is it and he's like uh been i've been fucking prostitute my we're god. like and i'm like uh, oh oh my god yeah <laughs> oh and um so this is the Which moment is when things lot. go wrong oh. that's a lot that's a big deal yeah okay it is and it isn't right because then you're just like, well, it's just sex. That's what your crazy mind is like, this has to work because I'm a Christian and I don't believe in divorce. Yes. And so my mind is just yeah. like, how, like I just kept spinning. Like, like how the... do I make this work? How do yes. I make this work? What right? is the spin that I can put on this to make it function? It needs to fit. Yes. Yeah. It has to it's fit. Terrified yes. to go outside of this yeah. box. And so um, I'm like, how long, how many? And it's like, oh, the majority of our marriage. Oh, at least 15 yeah oh my god yeah yeah okay at least (laughs) at least Mm, okay and then you know we go on i find out there's been another affair and that was what broke it for me and 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 that's what snapped me out of it because i was like okay if it's just sex that doesn't really fit and so it it exploded the entire thing for me Mm -hmm. and it's what allowed me to just be like yeah i'm i'm done i knew right away like i wanted a divorce uh like i couldn't i couldn't live with that um, it's very understandable. Yeah. And so that's kind of where things took a turn for me. That's where I, I started to think like, oh yeah, this isn't a life that I want. This hasn't been happy. And I could finally say it because I was like, oh, there has been a problem all this time. Right. And it's that underneath thing that I couldn't find ever. And, and, uh, you know, on top of just how crazy the story is and like feeling that problem, like he, he also gaslighted me during that time. Right. And I'd mm. say like, is there a problem? What, what is it? And he'd be like, yeah, it's your, it's you oh, <laughs> wow you know yeah, and it yeah. just like always was me and yeah. i've never felt like lower in my life yeah. you know yeah. as as a person and so wow i want to go back a little bit because i have i, I don't want to take away from no, the story please. because yeah. that is insane that yeah. is literally insane like that is your life yeah. and um i have a tremendous amount of empathy um 
partially because so you talked about starting like a, a house church a community like yeah. and you were you guys that was something you guys did together that well was something i mean we attempted to but do, yes exactly attempted to do <laughs> yeah. together yeah yeah and and i was i that's very similar to my own story right, right. and one of the things i didn't really get into and actually it came up because of a, a listener email that i got recently um, is that I started this. So I mentioned in, in my, in my, inter, in my interview that I started a house church and it's, yeah. I just sort of skimmed over it. Right. But that was like a very, very monumental part of my life because yeah. I, uh, I, I started this church. I had this idea, you know, from mm-hmm. reading this, these books yeah. that we're, we have in common. Right? Yes. And I was really inspired and I, and I, I had this, um, almost, I wouldn't, it's not manic in, a, in an unhealthy sense, but I had sure. this this period of my life where I was very up and I very I had a very clear understanding mm-hmm. of what I wanted to do and mm-hmm. um, and I, I I got some friends and I I you know I was uh, I think I was married at the time or I was about to get married I can't remember and um, I, I I I put together this I wasn't married I wasn't married yet but I was about to get engaged and I put together this video and it went it went semi-viral to a yeah. degree. Like I posted it on Facebook video, which uh-huh. is not a popular means of like passing then. back yeah. then. Back then, It was right, like right. 2010. Yeah. It was like people didn't use it. And it ended up getting passed around all over the country. People oh. from Canada, people from all over the United oh. States were, were contacting me like, hey, this is cool. I want to follow this community. I want to see what happens with it. Yeah. And I was getting all these messages and people that I didn't know were arguing over the content of this video. And it turned into this big thing. And um, I had set a date on the video. That was it Basically, I made this video for my, commu- my, my personal community. Yeah. Like, hey, this is what I'm doing if you're interested in yeah. it. And, um, and it ended up spreading into this big thing. And I'd set a date like, Hey, this is when I'm starting this house church. Uh, this is when it's starting and, and come to my house and see, you know, whatever. And yeah. I'm thinking like, you know, 10, 20, 10, 15, 20 people are going to yeah. show up maybe. And a week before that date, I hit a wall. Mm. I just hit this intense emotional wall and i fell into the still to this day the deepest depression that i've ever been Mm. in my life wow and it was right before i was about to become the leader of this community Mm. and then the january 9th comes which is the date that i set and uh 50 people showed up to my house and yeah (laughs) and i was uh i was in this you know like there was no turning back at that point i couldn't give it up and I, I had this powerful sense leading up to that date that this was what God wanted me to do. Yeah. And then right before it, I lost all sense of that mm-hmm. altogether. And I had mm. to, and I questioned everything mm-hmm. and I felt lost and I felt very alone, mm-hmm. which is sort of what made me use the yeah. word alone. Yeah. And I felt very alone, even though there are a bunch of people yeah, involved. Absolutely. It was like, how do I do this? And how do I, and I, a big part of it for me was what you were saying about like, I I don't want there to be a clergy lay person type of thing here, but how do I get other people to step up and lead? And everybody's looking to me and I'm in the middle of this room and there are 50 people sitting Mm -hmm. around me in a circle and I'm trying to deliver a message that's meaningful to these people, but I feel nothing. I feel completely void. All I felt was darkness. And it was like that for the next six months. Oh God. Um, And, Eventually, I started to lift out of it, but by that point, the community had diminished because mm-hmm. I, I didn't have the. There was no energy. Behind there was it. I didn't have the energy yeah. to lead. Yeah. I didn't. I, it wasn't what Which people expected. Which is so funny because it was like the entire point is like there is no leader, right? But if you you were the leader, still, right? Right. Still, and so it's like yes. yeah, and that's that's crazy, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like yeah, I, I get it. I get why yeah. it was that way, but. Um, anyway, I, I just, yeah, yeah, I, I've, I've sort of been wanting to talk about that on the show because yeah. I know a lot of, um, of Christians who have fallen into depression in similar situations yeah. where they, they're in leadership or, uh, or they feel like they're on a, a mission. They feel like they're mm-hmm. doing something important and then suddenly they lose that. Well, and then it creates a pedestal as well. Right. And I think you feel that yes. from other people and like this expectation, even yes. if it's, everybody's equal i mean it's never really like that Mm. right people always seek what they know and so it's like everybody is recreating this because they've never been outside of it they don't even know how yes yeah so what i hear from your story Kristen, is that you went from one controlling situation to i mean kind of another with your with your ex-husband absolutely it was a different type of control. well even if you go back to you know church 
Mm-hmm. Before it's, that, it's church to cult to well, marriage. And to marriage, what you know is of marriage as a Christian person, right? It, it like for women, it automatically is a controlling situation, regardless, yes. regardless of what it is, because the way the Bible like pins you in and the way theology pins you in is like, well, you're not the head. You don't get to make the decisions. And so you're sinful if you're outside of that. Maybe you have some input. And and if you don't, that's still still within like a normal view of marriage. So what I want to talk about um, when we get back from this break <laughs> is about oh the God. steps that you took yeah, to get fine. control back so that you can be your true self. Mm-hmm. So we'll talk about that right when we get back. If you were going <laughs> to die tonight, do you know where Stop. you Stop. <laughs> just tell them about our website. Oh, just tell them to go to the lifeafter.org. <laughs> yes, they can go now, even without accepting <laughs> Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. <laughs> <laughs> the lifeafter.org. Yes. We have a blog, contact page, a link to our Facebook page, <laughs> and more. All right, the lifeafter.org. Heavenly. Welcome back. Um, Kristen, I really want to focus on the the word that I always think of when I think of you and your story is the word control. Absolutely, That's what you needed to get back in your life, Mm -hmm. right? Um, I mean, it's what I needed to establish in my life. I had never had it. You never had it because it went from your family to moving out to um, to the cult and then Mm -hmm. from there to your husband. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And then he lost the ability to have that place in your life. Yeah. And I you, mean, well, what's interesting about that is about six months before uh, before everything exploded, before I had any idea about any of that, um, I started reading this book by Pema Chodron. It's called The Guide to Fearlessness in Difficult Times. Mm-hmm. And it changed my life, even during that time. Um, you know how the Bible and, and the teachings are like, be kind, be compassionate, be all these things. Um, but it never really shows you how. Mm-hmm. It never tells you how to get there. And I mean, it also is like works on the paradigm that that's like impossible for you to accomplish on your own. Only God can do it. Try to do it. But if you try, it's probably sinful. And like, you know, it just is this like weird circle. Lack of thing. logic. Right, yeah, right, right. And you like can never accomplish it. And, it. and it doesn't show you how. And this book was like, this is how. This is how you become compassionate. And it was like mm-hmm. even more guided towards like your own. Like it's just like you have to start with yourself. And it's like imagine yourself as a friend. Right. And so it went through all of these ideas and it was like so refreshing for me. But it was so interesting because it finally allowed me to be honest with myself in just the smallest way that like maybe I don't believe this stuff, you know, and I, I started questioning it even then. And then when everything exploded, I was like, primed for it because I finally had a pathway to feel compassionate with myself, um, to be kind to myself. And so I was oriented that way. And that allowed me to move past everything that was happening into this new place. So the way that I look at it in my life is I, I feel like there's, there's Brady now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, and I see Kristen now and Chuck now. And so there's the versions of us where we are more ourselves we've ever been. We're Mm -hmm. not trying to add in Jesus. We're not trying to spiritualize everything, but I feel like I existed as I am now back then, Mm -hmm. but it was kind of like I was tied up in a closet and I had, you know, duct tape over my mouth and I didn't have, Mm -hmm. but there were times where I would come out and say like, you know, I would tell the, the version of me that was operating then the Christian version of like, Hey, I don't believe some of this stuff. Sometimes I really do have some real legitimate doubts, but didn't have the ability or the, um, the courage to allow myself to Mm -hmm. rip off that duct tape and listen to what I had to say. Mm -hmm. But I love this idea of like, you became a friend to yourself and you were able to, um, communicate that to yourself and you gave yourself the permission Mm -hmm. and the space to do that. In what other ways did you become a friend to yourself after your divorce? Uh, So because my divorce was considered like a traumatic experience because it was something that I had no idea was coming. Um, Mm -hmm. So my life changed. It was on your anniversary trip that you found out that he was with prostitutes. Absolutely. Yeah, it was just the entire thing. And I I like besides that one thought, like I really didn't have any other inclination towards like thinking that this would be possible or real or true. Um, And so because of that, I was like, you know, this is a pretty fucked up situation for my kids as it is. And so with them, uh, I decided like, yeah, I definitely, definitely need to go to therapy. Right. And so that was the very first thing that I pursued. I, uh, left and and moved in with my sister for a while and, uh, and, and found a good therapist. And, um, so basically I started by like 
recognizing what self-care meant in that time. And so that I just did anything that I thought could help me feel better in these moments, right? Knowing that this was going to be an intensive and very long process for myself to heal emotionally from, I found whatever I could to um, kind of bolster my ability to care for my children and to like get through this time. Do you think that you going to therapy was um, set up by the book that you read? Like, do you think you would have gone to therapy if you had not read that book? I think I would have anyway. I was begging all through my marriage for my uh, my husband at the time and I to go. I like, you know, part of my work and he would always refuse. He didn't want to. Or he would sometimes agree and then refuse when I would actually book the mm. appointments or whatever. Um, but yeah, I think I would have gone either way. I think I was in a place where I could actually function uh, in like I, I was moving forward already. I was moving in the direction of what a lot of therapists would have taken me anyway. And I had done some of the work already. Um, and so it was helpful. But I think I would have gone either way. Chuck, I don't remember. Actually, did you... Did you end up going through therapy or anything after your I did, yeah. You did? I, okay. Yeah. I went, actually went to a Christian therapist because somebody, somebody that I knew was reputable, mm. uh, that I knew wasn't, you know, going to just shove a bunch of Bible stuff down my throat because I, I wanted somebody that would understand the culture that I was coming from. And I didn't know that I, I didn't know anybody that would, that would like specialize in that. So I went to a Christian Counselor, and he was actually, he was great. He was really good. That's so fascinating to me because I pursued absolutely a secular therapist. Yeah, Same so here. did Brady. Yeah. Same here, yeah. yeah. I like didn't care if they could I totally relate understand to it. that too. Yeah. yeah, and especially as a woman, I didn't want someone that would reinforce what I had just gotten out yes. of. It was like yes. clearly so beyond, and yeah. I just couldn't handle anyone telling me anything. Like I knew I needed to figure it out for myself at yeah. that point. Yeah, this was somebody that I, I knew two two or three people that had seen him and mm-hmm. that I, whose opinions I respected sure. and I was like okay I think I can trust this guy yeah. to and I sat down and I immediately said like I don't believe this anymore don't identify as a Christian but I wanted to talk to you because you understand where mm-hmm. I'm coming from mm-hmm. so he had the ability of being a therapist first and yes. a Christian second yes mm-hmm. I think okay yes. so now I understand wow. your decision making I think that makes sense to mm-hmm. me then um, because I, I think that with all the Christian counseling that I dealt with, well, and you know, honestly, it, it was a Christian counselor. It was the first one to tell me that my situation was what would be considered spiritual abuse. Oh, wow. And that was the first time I even heard that term. And mm-hmm. he really was the first person to empathize with me and, and open my eyes to, mm-hmm. oh, wow, this situation is really controlling and abusive and right. I need to get out of it. Right. Um, what are kind of the big things for you that you learned about yourself or that you learned about what's best for you and a way to kind of like reorient yourself Mm -hmm. that you Mm -hmm. learned through therapy, if you don't mind sharing. No, absolutely. Um, I think the biggest, yeah, the thing that I've worked the hardest on is, Mm -hmm. uh, listening to my own voice, but like finding it and listening to it, listening to my body and, and my mind, like when they're telling me things. And, um, that's not a natural state for someone who's grown up constantly trying to oppress that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, I think, been the hardest work because when I got into therapy, uh, it was just kind of like, I would say something and be like, right, you know, like always looking for my therapist to affirm everything I was saying I needed. And, and like, I, I needed her to help me basically gauge what reality was as I was coming out into the secular world and like finding out what is normal out here. I had absolutely no benchmark for it at all. And so she became that for me until I could be it for myself. Wow. I'm noticing that with a lot with our emails and everything that we're getting from our fans is that so much of our experience is about having to deny yourself of who you are and what is important to you. And it's like redirecting with this indoctrination to a completely different direction that if you don't believe in that belief system, it just looks absolutely absurd and makes no sense in the real world. Um, yeah. It's weird to hear the story over and over yes. and over from people. Yeah. It, it, it it's weird, but it's not, so not weird, right? Because it's normalized. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's it's it's. Uh, I guess what I mean is that it's it's common. It's common. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's common. But why is it common? At what point do we wake right. up and say, "No, you can just be yourself. Right. You can just exist in the way that you are." There was a day that you and I sat down and we were talking. Our kids are playing. Yeah. 
And we had a conversation about um, what you called landmarks. Mm -hmm. And I remember hearing what you had to say, and it blew my mind because of how important it was. Um, Walk me through that. What is a landmark, and how do you use that as a tool to keep yourself sane? Right. So um, as someone that grew up in the church, I... I think because of having that constant voice being like, you can't trust yourself, that manifests itself for me uh, as anxiety. So my mind spins, right? Something small happens and it triggers a memory and it's blown out of proportion and I examine it over and over. And I think this happens for a lot of people. Mm. But Yeah, I have have no experience in this whatsoever. (laughs) (laughs) He said sarcastically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) And so when that happens, you know, I didn't even know I dealt with anxiety. Maybe like six months in, I was think I'm someone with anxiety. And my right. therapist oh shit, what does like, this mean? Like, what am I going to yeah. do if I have anxiety? Oh like, da, 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 you know, yeah, my gets... therapist was like, uh-huh. <laughs> yes, she was like, yes. <laughs> Wait, oh, you didn't realize. Okay. But it like blew my mind. I had no frame of reference and I didn't yes. realize that I am an anxious person my entire life. And I can mm-hmm. pinpoint that coming from, you know, like the teachings that I grew up with. So mm-hmm. now that I can recognize it, I can see it when it's happening many times. And so I can sit with it. And then when I sit with it, I can think like, okay, first of all, I'm being triggered, right? Notice Mm -hmm. that, recognize it, and then move on to, is this, uh, am I actually in danger? Because a lot of times triggering will elicit a fight or flight response, right? And so you're you're in lizard brain, you're not like thinking clearly. And so to help myself think more clearly, I go back and I'm just like, okay, so is this threat in the now? Am I actually experiencing a threat or is this a memory? Right. And so uh, kind of pulling it apart that way. Um, And then once I kind of can recognize that, that allows me to work through it. If it's not a threat in this moment, I can sit with it and know the anxiety still might not pass in that moment, but I can know that it is going to pass in time, Hmm. you know, and that allows me to have some calm with it. Um, I know that it's like I'm not going to be in this state of mind forever. I'm not going to be stuck. Um, And so it's kind of those tools that my therapist taught me that. that have allowed me to kind of step back from these situations and think through what's happening and not just react to everything. Um, and so each one of those steps is what we would call like a landmark. Yeah. And so each of those questions basically is a landmark. And that's what I come back to. Uh, and that's what pulls me back into reality is like, okay, I have a process that I can go to that pulls me down and grounds mm-hmm. me. Yeah. So it's like if you are in a place you're not used to and you're driving home and finally you start seeing these mm-hmm. these things and you're able to get mm-hmm. back home and back to where you belong. And I would, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, the way you described that was excellent. Uh, neurochemically, literally, our anxiety comes from yeah. a fight or flight. It's literally our, our fight or flight instinct kicking in. Yeah. But because we now have the ability to look into the future and to and to perceive things that aren't happening immediately, mm-hmm. we kick into that mode, mm-hmm. right? And it it, create, it generates adrenaline mm-hmm. and it, it causes anxiety. Yeah. Um, I would like to contrast that briefly with... Uh, the biblical approach to anxiety, which is the birds of the air and the the flowers of the field, yeah. right? Like, just don't like, just don't God worry. Will, yeah, just don't, don't worry don't. about tomorrow, right? Which is a good message, right? To a degree, can be, but it's it doesn't it doesn't cover it doesn't give you it doesn't say what are your triggers. And again, just like compassion, joy, whatever, it doesn't give you a pathway to not worry. It just says yes. just don't, just yes. do it. Which is which is More the Bible's suppression. approach to a lot of exactly. things. Just don't, right? Yeah don't there's no explanation for how to get to don't yeah it's just don't like for me it was it was lust Mm -hmm. right it was quote unquote Mm -hmm. lust it was just don't Mm -hmm. like never mind that you're a sexual human never mind that repression is going to cause you to engage in all kinds of like self-destructive behavior never mind that just don't well and then it also leaves you vulnerable again to be in a situation where you will follow someone who has a pathway who and, mm. and they are considered higher than you they're considered enlightened by God. Wow. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And and when you get in those situations where if you like you said you got in a lot of trouble when you were in the cult and you All did something time. wrong yeah. then your mind starts playing at that of like oh my god i'm not going to be accepted i'm yeah. going to lose my family i'm going to lose you know these friends i'm not going you know so you yeah. that's how it was for me is mm-hmm. i felt like i had to do all of these things perfectly yeah. um 
and there's um, yeah, there's this ex- expectation of of doing it. The way that I looked at Christianity was almost like a like a formula, like a like a, mm-hmm. a, a magic spell. That here are the all the ingredients that I have to put in here, and um, if I do all of those things, then here is going to be the result. I'm going to be happy, and I'm going to be in this community. Absolutely. But if I don't have all of these things in a row, then I'm going to fail in this community, and it's going to be painful. And so that's when the adrenaline really starts mm-hmm. to. The hidden and anxiety. Well, and especially for me, because it wasn't my actions that they were critical of, right? It was my heart, Mm. which is like even more just like, yeah, how are you supposed to fix that? I literally developed a twitch in my left eye because I was so stressed out about like, there's nothing more I can do. I'm meeting everything that you're asking me to do. And you're just saying, there's just a head heart disconnect. You know, there's, Mm. and and like, what can you do about it? They don't give you direction about it, but it's just like you as a person are bad. You know, Shame. regardless of what but they're you making do, assumptions about you your intentions, they're, they're making assumptions and judgments yeah. about what's going on From in your the brain. Outside. Exactly. And so I felt like I, I, there was nothing I could do that would ever be good enough. And, uh, you know, my therapist pointed out like, yeah, you could never gain acceptance in that group. Right. And, and so that's what was so profound about it. Like I joined this group, I moved across the country and it was just like, even like literally I could not do more. And yeah. still it wasn't enough. You weren't feeling accepted. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, exactly. Wow. Yeah. Damn. I relate with that. I mean, that's, that's how it was with my last community was, um, it felt like no matter what we did, it wasn't enough. Like our pastor would say, if you're not spending an hour and a half in the Bible every day, then you're just pretending. Yeah. Um, they were like, have such control over what us young people were doing. Cause we wanted to do more. We wanted to have like, you know, more studies together and like, well, no, we don't, we don't trust mm-hmm. you all to do that on your own. Mm-hmm. And so there was like this thing of where we wanted to appease them. We wanted to prove ourselves to them. That's what I always felt like. I felt like I was constantly having to prove my worthiness of being part of that mm-hmm. community. And it was never, ever, ever going to be good enough. Mm-hmm. I never felt like I was going to be good enough. No. I mean, does anyone? No. But I mean, you add all this other dogma and this fight or flight, or if you don't do this, then you're not really a Christian. And if you're not really a Christian, the implication is that you're going to burn in hell for eternity. Um, it starts when you're a toddler, yeah. you get indoctrinated in it, and then they've got control. Well, you know, in some ways, I feel like uh, grateful for the experience that I've had because it was so extreme. It was like, you know, all the normal stuff, but just much more extreme. And I feel like if I hadn't, when I make a synopsis about my time in Christianity. I'm like, you know, I followed it to as far as I could go. I went to the very end of it and I found that there was nothing there, you know? Mm. And, and if I hadn't, I know that I would still be in it today. If I hadn't gone as far as I really felt like I could, I would still be there spinning my wheels. That's interesting. Cause when we talked to Jamie and in my story, like one of the things was that we went from different denominations to different denomination because we felt like we were still missing something. You need to, it's but you, so you hit the end of that. You got to the end. Yeah. Yeah. In two ways. Right. And so I, I left yeah. it. <laughs> like it wasn't like. Yes. Stop. <laughs> one big. Uh... Mm-hmm. <laughs> they it just ended up being going over time. Once, but I had two very yeah so Kristen this has been kind of a heavy episode we've covered a lot yeah. of ground I spilled I spilled my guts a little bit yeah Brady spilled some guts you spilled some guts yeah. there's some guts out on this on this table that we're recording at <laughs> like a slaughterhouse in here yeah <laughs> Saul 8 it smells funny where are you now where am I now um yeah, I'm happy. Yeah. I think in complete synopsis, I have had the opportunity um, through therapy and through hard work uh, to just be able to think about what I actually like as a person for the first time in my entire life. Right. Um, I'm like a real person. Yeah. You know, I've like come out here into the world. I've had experience and, uh, and I'm really happy. I can make decisions based on what I want, like what I want. Just what I want. That's like as far as I ever have to go. Sure. And yeah. just the idea like that I can always change my mind, that my life is flexible and open and good. Like that I am a person as is, I'm good and I'm enough or anything. You are wow. enough. Yeah. Right. It's. Yeah. Good. It just hit me of how listening to you speak. Um, 
when we feel we have to spiritualize everything, we're literally dehumanizing ourselves. Mm. Um, when we have to add this spirit to everything, we're taking away our humanity. I am so glad that you have control over yourself and your life again for, for the first time, honestly. Absolutely. Um, the decisions that you make are the decisions that you want Thank to you be guys. making that reflect you. You don't have to have a like a quiet voice in the back of your mind that's like, yeah. I don't know about this. No, you're that voice that used to say, I don't know about that yeah. is, is who you are now. Yeah. I'm glad. And I'm so glad that our friendship has come back. Yeah. Um, it's huge. It's been such a big deal for me. Um, thank you so much for coming today. Thanks, Kristen. In the beginning of the episode, I talked to you about um, Joseph Campbell and his philosophy of the hero's journey in the monomyth. So many times, the things that once were our weaknesses become our biggest strengths. Um, that's what we heard with Kristen today. Her lack of control, her lack of power, is now turned into her ability to make decisions for herself that are best for her and her family. We talked a lot today also about therapy. I want to encourage our listeners out there, um, if that is an opportunity for you, if that is a possibility for you, do not have the pride to keep you away from something that could help you become more of who you are. Thank you all so much for listening today. Um, Find us on Facebook and stay in touch with us as we grow our community. This has been The Life After. No, fuck that. I'm Brady Harden. Yeah. I, I introduced myself too much.